Hi, I'm John Morton, and this is the 240Z we've won so many races with. Now, this one's been specially modified for racing, but many of the features that make this car a champion on the racetracks also make it an excellent performer in the street. The S30 was always going to be a tough act for the company to follow. Nissan sold over half a million of them since its introduction in 1970. It appealed to pretty much everyone. General buyers appreciated its unparalleled ergonomics and practicality in the segment, while enthusiasts enjoyed the Z's class-leading power and low base price. Despite its shortcomings, the motoring press took to it quite well. No other offering in the Z segment could keep up with it and this remained the case throughout the decade. While strangling safety and emissions regulations cast a shadow over the sports car world, the S30 managed to get by relatively unscathed. It showed an uncanny ability to adapt to ever-changing conditions. Nissan couldn't keep the car on the market forever though. Fuel crises, pollution concerns, and safety guidelines negatively affected performance and styling. The S30 as resilient as it proved to be, was not designed with these conditions in mind. Nissan needed a car for the 80s. Steve Wozniak owns two of the world's most impressive sports cars. What's your favorite, Steve? I prefer the Z. Is it that sleek style? It isn't enough for automotive designers to possess artistic mastery and strong interpersonal skills. They also need to be clairvoyant and to know what people will want before they even know they want it. Nissan's product planners were faced with the issue of figuring out what the Z of the future would look like. Development work stretches all the way back to 1974. Surveying existing customers seemed like the best place to start. Z owners used their cars for everyday tasks, such as commuting and shopping. They noted that its use cases weren't that far removed from that of a sedan. This was hardly surprising to Nissan, seeing as how the S30 was designed in the vein of a daily driver people also had a certain expectation of the qualities that a sports car should possess. They wanted a fast, nibble machine, even though they probably rarely pushed the machine to its limits, if ever. The image of a sports car was a huge factor for them. It also needed to appeal to American sensibilities, since the company predicted that 70% of production would go to that country. The early ideation phase began in two blocks. In the first phase, designers were encouraged to explore ideas without adhering to the Z legacy. Even though the drawings were relatively loose, there were a few elements that were all but guaranteed to make the cut. A long hood and short overhangs were expected of a front engine, rear wheel drive coupe. Designers clashed over the finer details though. The B pillar, for instance, saw a wide variety of executions. Another came up in the second sketching phase, which was more grounded in comparison to the first one of the most contentious issues was the execution of the front grille. The old S30 had a wide opening that was bisected by the bumper. While it's undoubtedly iconic, it also wasn't the most elegant solution. And this definitely showed in the late model 260Z and 280Z. Designers tried to modernize this element with a more integrated solution. It wasn't until they stepped into the wind tunnel that they chose a direction. Sealing off the opening above the bumper and sending the air through the lower intake proved to be a better solution. A front end spoiler channeled more cooling into this area and had the added benefit of reducing front end lift. The headlights were also up in the air. The sugar scoop units were another defining characteristic of the old car. Retractable headlights were in vogue during this time, but in the end, the company decided to stick with the traditional housings. To them, it was far more important to reinforce the Z identity than to conform to styling trends. Engineers also found that they provided more aerodynamic benefits than pop-up units. After a lengthy design process, the company found itself with a pair of proposals. They were similar in many ways, with the main differences lying in the front bumper and B-pillar. The first had a front-end signature that wasn't too far removed from the old 240ZG. The window support also blended in with the surrounding glass, creating a sleeker overall look. The second bid featured an angular bumper as well as a more ornate B-pillar. In the end, they decided to go with the second one. Styling wasn't their only consideration. Nissan had to ensure that it could excel as a daily driver. 
safety, usability, and NVH were all prime considerations. In terms of crash protection, the IP was designed to collapse and absorb the impact if the driver were thrown against it in the event of an accident. Interior controls were also adjusted to make them as safe and usable as possible. Hard or protruding items that could prove hazardous during an impact were replaced with large and soft touch points. Visibility was also an important factor in this regard. Smaller A-pillars resulted in a 3% improvement in frontal sight lines. Nissan measured this by using a fisheye lens to replicate the perspective of the driver. While the visibility out the rear was more or less the same, the back window was much larger. This brought more light into the interior and made the cockpit more inviting overall. The urethane bumpers at the front and rear of the car are a more unified structure. Cars marked for the US and Canada were equipped with shock absorbers. Overall interior volume increased dramatically. The S30 had 57 cubic feet of space. The S130, meanwhile, had about 73. Luggage capacity increased 37% from 7.47 cubic feet to 12.61 cubic feet. After three years of work, 200 prototypes, and tens of thousands of test miles, the Datsun 280ZX entered production in July of 1978. Exports to the US began in October, while sales officially kicked off the following month. Its push-up market was most evident in its $9,900 base price. The 2.8-liter engine should have looked pretty familiar to Americans. It was the same engine that was in the market-exclusive 280Z. Japanese buyers also had the option of a 2-liter variant that made 130 horsepower. Journalists got a chance to check out the car at an event at Portland International Speedway, and they were instantly able to discern the differences between the S130 and its predecessor. The headline in Car and Driver said it all. 1979 Datsun 280ZX evolves into a personal luxury car. Patrick Bedard remarked that it resembled something that Buick would put out if they ever decided to enter the segment. It was well behaved at lower speeds with the magazine stating that it was, quote, more along the lines of a luxury car than a sporting machine. It did not inspire much confidence under hard driving. The rear end was far too eager to come out. A bit of this can contribute to a more engaging driving experience, but the S130 continually spiraled out of their control. It drew unfavorable comparisons to the Porsche 911. While skilled drivers could rein that car in in those situations, the Datsuns seemed to be beyond help. The 2 Plus 2 was a bit more stable, though they weren't very fond of that car's dynamics either. Whatever ground was lost here was made up in the interior. The driving position and instrument placement earned high marks. The seats struck a balance between comfort and support and were endlessly configurable. Its host of features also impressed. Cruise control, power steering, and a central warning system were just a few of the extras that came with the top-of-the-line Grand Luxury trim. The driver's side window could also be lowered completely with a simple press of a button. The article stated that no one, not even the likes of Cadillac, had a feature like that. It also had a dual fuel gauge. The main part goes from full to empty like normal. Right under this is a secondary display that essentially puts the last quarter of range under a microscope. It might seem like a silly detail nowadays, but it probably appealed to those living in the fuel-starved 70s. In the end, they found that the new Z was a compelling offering as long as it wasn't pushed outside of its comfort zone. While they lamented the car's change in scope, they could at least appreciate the car that was in front of them. The S30 let the pack the moment it was released, but the scene had changed drastically since 1970. Competition was stronger than ever. Would the S130 see the same dominance? A 1979 Motor Trend comparison illustrated just how level the playing field had become. The magazine matched the 2 Plus 2 up against its closest rival in the Celica Supra. It equaled the Datsun in terms of smoothness, performance, and fuel economy. The Supra was also over $4,000 cheaper. 
While they had reservations about the exterior styling, Motor Trend staff concluded that the Supra was the superior car in many ways. A 1981 car and driver test put the two-seater model up against the other premier sports cars of the day. While some of them weren't exactly in the same vein as the Z, it did show how varied the sports car market had become. The Alfa Romeo and Fiat were holdovers from the previous decade and were among the last of a dying breed. Porsche's 924 was their attempt at a relatively affordable sports coupe. The rotary-powered RX-7 was shaping up to be the S30 of the 80s, and while the Corvette was overdue for a replacement, it still offered plenty of raw thrills. With all of these cars and approaches, the Z was sure to stand out in its own way, right? The first leg of their journey saw them travel from Los Angeles to Santa Maria. The trip included boundless freeways and twisty mountain passes. The roadsters excelled in the hills, with their roofs stowed away. Cars of that sort were few and far between, and the Italians left the riders wondering why that was the case. The wind and noise became a bit much after a while, but the cars still stood out. Conversely, the Mazda and Porsche were sophisticated machines that handled everything thrown their way with ease. Even the Corvette managed to charm them. The Z was the odd one out. While it was a decent enough straight-line cruiser, the numb driving dynamics were, in their eyes, totally unbefitting of a sports car. Things remained the same the following day when they arrived at Willow Springs Raceway. The 924 was right at home on the track, while the RX-7 wasn't very far behind. The Spiders weren't the tarmac scalpels that the aforementioned cars were, though they were still able to have a bit of fun with them. Chevrolet's offering actually had the fastest lap out of the bunch. The Z was simply out of its element here, as the issues that cropped up during the road test were only accentuated here. When the scorecards were added up, the Z finished in 5th place, just ahead of the Fiat. These sentiments were shared across the automotive press. Motor praised the smooth and quiet engine, but stated that it, quote, did not arouse great enthusiasm as a driving machine from any of our group testers. Road Test Magazine placed it third on the triple threat with an RX-7 and Chevrolet Corvette. Don Fuller referred to the Z as a penalty box because it handled so poorly compared to the other two. They were clearly missing the old model and bemoaned its new direction, but it was exactly what Nissan set out to build. No longer was it a homely, affordable runabout. It was evolving into a touring car that carried the burden of representing the entire company. The transition wasn't complete quite yet, but the changes were already turning people's idea of a Z car on its head. Whether or not enthusiasts took to it didn't matter much. The market had spoken. 64,459 Z cars were sold in its first year on the market. Though both generations were on sale concurrently, Brian Long notes that the vast majority of them were S30s. The S130 more than picked up the slack in 1979, where nearly 72,000 of them found buyers. It was also named Motor Trend's Import Car of the Year, Viewers of the channel also picked it as their favorite between it and a few flavors of the Z31. One commenter pointed to the engine as the reason for their selection. The facelifted Z31 wasn't very far behind. Take off with the most exhilarating new car of the year, the Datsun Turbo ZX. Car enthusiasts were in for a treat at the 1979 Frankfurt Motor Show. The company unveiled the 280ZX 2 Plus 2 TT. The first T represented its T-bar roof, while the second T hinted at a turbocharged engine. Let's start with the new roof. Nissan planned on equipping the car with a full-on Targa top, but time constraints and rigidity concerns led them to the present solution. The world would have to wait a bit longer for a traditional convertible Z. The panels could be had on the two-seater as well as a 2 plus 2. They struck a middle ground between open-air motoring and structural stability. It became available in the US in 1980 and in Europe the year after. The more pertinent addition to the lineup was the turbocharger. It went on sale in April of 1981 with a few caveats. In the first year, Buyers could only get it in the two-seater T-top body style and equipped with an automatic transmission. 
Nissan didn't put a manual inside to start because they didn't think their in-house manual could take the extra power. The slush box that was available needed to be reinforced as well. A stick could be had later in the year, while the 2 Plus 2 became available in 82. The 280ZX Turbo hit the scene at a price of $17,000. This would equate to nearly $55,000 in today's money. The turbocharger bumped its already respectable horsepower figure of 145 to a whopping 180. For comparison's sake, the L81 Corvette of the same vintage had 190 horsepower. That was the most powerful American production car that year. An off-center Naga duct on the hood and twin exhaust tips at the rear were visual cues. On paper, it completely changed the car's character from a cruiser to an outright rocket relatively speaking. The turbo made its way to the Japanese market late in 1982, but only the 2-liter variant would receive forced induction. Back in America, car and driver recorded a 0-60 time of 6.8 seconds. For the early 1980s, this was seriously impressive. It then declared that it was, quote, the quickest automatic transmission machine in the country. This drastic increase in power and price placed it among entirely new competition. In the December 1981 edition of Car and Driver, it squared off against the Porsche 911, Ferrari 308 GTS, and DeLorean DMC-12. The particular ZX used in the comparison was actually a prototype fitted with a manual. It had other experimental odds and ends as well. Fit and finish wasn't quite on the level as the others, but it still managed to keep pace with them. In terms of straight line acceleration, only the Porsche was faster. It also lost out on the top speed crown to the Ferrari. The magazine placed it third, which was impressive enough on its own. When the price is considered, the results are downright shocking. The 280ZX had the second lowest base price of them all. The Corvette started at about $16,250, but the test car cost about $19,000. The other three cars were priced from $25,000 to over $56,000. Nissan could at least take solace in the fact that it was in the mix of those other cars at all. It went from a bit of a disappointment to a car that punched well above its weight. Nissan thought that it would bolster already strong sales of the Z. Instead, they fell to about $63,000 in 1981 and then to about $57,000 in 1982. Thankfully, Nissan had an update in the works that they hoped would give the model line a shot in the arm. Today there's a new power on the road. Today all eyes are on the sports car news of the decade. The first Nissan 300ZX. The S130 would only be on the market for about five years. Nissan was already hard at work on its follow-up, internally dubbed the Z31. It wouldn't be an entirely new car. Engineers used a modified version of the S130's chassis. The ensuing changes resulted in an improved coefficient of drag from 0.385 to 0.30. It also featured reimagined sugar scoop headlights, which fit more with the car's angular lines. They also allowed Japanese owners to flash oncoming traffic in their retracted position. The significant changes came inside of the engine bay. The old power plants were retired from the Z-Line and replaced with a line of six-cylinder engines. Markets outside of Japan only had the naturally aspirated VG30E and turbocharged VG30ET 3.0-liter V6s. The former made 160 horsepower and 173 pound-foot, while the latter made 200 horsepower and 227 pound-foot. In Europe, this engine made something closer to 230 horsepower and 242 pound-foot. The situation was a bit different in Japan. Here, the VG30ET made its full power rating until October 1986. After this, it was detuned to 195 horsepower and 227 pound-foot. Buyers out here could also have the car with a 2-liter motor. The 170 horsepower VG20ET was available until 1986. This was when the RB20 DET in line 6 was introduced. It made 10 more horsepower than the engine it replaced. 
the turbocharger made use of a turbine rotor made from ceramic. This reduced its moment of inertia by a whopping 45%, reducing turbo lag and improving engine responsiveness. It was developed in collaboration with NGK and earned Nissan a prize from the Japan Gas Turbine Academic Society in 1986. 1987 saw the introduction of the VG30DE. This was a naturally aspirated 4-valve dual overhead cam V6 that gave the car a different character, as Jack Yamaguchi explains. The twin cam engine delivers a rare combination of a fat torque curve, low in the rev range, and a willingness to wind instantly to the 7000 RPM limit. The Z31 went on sale in the US in October of 1983. The base two-seater was priced from $15,800, while the turbo began at about $18,200. A base model that would have been priced from about $13,000 was not offered in the US due to voluntary import quotas. It came out just as the Datsun brand was being phased out worldwide. The S130 was officially batched Datsun 280ZX by Nissan, but the new car had no Datsun badging on it whatsoever. Road and Track said that it was, quote, the same, only more so, before going on to state that fans of the 280ZX would be fond of this car as well. Of course, it was also unlikely to win over its critics. It did have superior handling to its predecessor, but overall, it was seen as a mild revision. In 1984, Nissan released the 300ZX Turbo 50th Anniversary to commemorate the company's half-centenary. There were a host of exclusive features, including silver over black paintwork, color keyed bumpers, gold inlaid wheels, unique seat emblems, and a set of gold keys. Mechanical changes included a new front air dam and stiffer springs. There were no options aside from the choice of either a manual or automatic. They were priced at $26,000 and allocations were limited. Nissan shipped just 5,148 examples to the US and another 300 to Canada. Sales surged upon the Z31's introduction. About 71,000 were sold in 1983 and just over 73,000 were sold in 1984. And then numbers declined to about 67,000 in 85. A mild update in 1986 introduced a redesigned front end, flared wheel arches, and more aggressive side skirts. The off-center hood scoop present on turbo models was also deleted. This previewed a more comprehensive facelift in 1987. Nissan's North American design studio in San Diego developed this revision. Nissan Design International was established in 1979 and began doing business in 1983. This was an important project for the emerging satellite studio. It featured yet another redesigned front end, thinner tail lights, new wheels, a tweaked suspension setup, and larger brake calipers. This did nothing to help with free-falling Z-sales. 1987 saw Nissan move just 33,000 of them. In 88, they dipped below the 20,000 mark. The writing was on the wall for the Z31. It was time for a replacement. About 414,000 S130s and 329,000 Z31s were produced during their respective runs on the market. While they kept the Z relevant throughout the late 70s and early 80s, neither car had the cultural impact of the original. All this changed in the 90s.